I'm Daryl Jones, Director of Research at Hedgeye. Welcome to the Sector Spotlight on Communications with, as we like to call him, the Freebird, Andrew Friedman, <laughs> who is uh, one of our excellent analysts, homegrown here, and has been covering the sector for a number of years now and had some great calls. Uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Andrew, who's going to, I think, spend about 30 minutes going through his sector and some of his top ideas, and yep. then we'll get into Q&A. So he has a lot of knowledge, so ask whatever you want. Yep, and thanks, Daryl, for the intro. It's good to be in the studio. Uh, we're gonna also we're gonna touch on Match too, which I know is probably one of your favorite. Yeah, well. uh, you get some primary research from you <laughs> on that. Um, so I'm gonna touch on quickly just what Communications Pro is. I'm not gonna spend too much time there. I'm also not gonna go on process because I want to make sure that we spend a lot of time talking about Roku and Match, and just showing you our analysis and running through the thesis there. Um, but on slide three, in terms of what is Communications Pro, it's a synthesis of our institutional research. Uh, we have our position manner includes best idea roundups, uh, industry insights and field notes um, from folks in the industry uh, who live and breathe um, it every day. Uh, we're analysts uh, and we're in models and we read fi uh, financial statements, but it's always another thing entirely to actually speak with operators and gain those types of insights. Uh, we also have a pretty healthy uh, war chest of alternative data uh, as well as surveys as well, which we'll go through here. Um, in terms of you know, we launched Communications Pro in the beginning of October. This is just an example of some of the best idea roundups we did. They're about 30-minute video presentations on our top ideas. On slide five, this is a summary of some field notes, and we publish about a dozen or so a quarter, ranging from um, field, uh, agencies as well as uh, you know, people, uh, folks on the content production side. And again, it's really, the focus is to really understand key business trends. So for example, at the beginning of the quarter, it was really helpful to speak with folks that are um, you know, uh, content producers to really understand the impact that COVID had across the industry, as well as uh, field notes with agencies to understand how the various social media stocks are, are faring in this COVID recovery. On slide six, this is the tracker update. So we mix the anecdotes with the data as well as our fundamental work. And you can just see the sample of work that we published. Uh, our winter is coming note uh, on our Netflix tracker, which we had an out of consensus negative call going to this print specifically. We've also uh, uh, done work on tracking content popularity for Netflix uh, because that's an important driver of subscriber growth. And then for Live Nation, uh, what we're showing the app download data for Ticketmaster, which uh, does not have a pulse at the moment. We also have other proprietary data sets that track the supply of live events, as well as the recovery there. And we publish all these um, to our vertical. On the position monitor updates, this is the more higher frequency data um, points, but we publish our, um, our audio commentary from the morning call every morning, as well as a weekly uh, review of the key topics in our space. Also, uh, more hi uh, higher frequency data updates. For example, uh, we did a survey to figure out uh, or try to uh, assess how uh, Mulan, Pivod uh, compared to other Disney films. So this is just an overview of the, pro of the product so far. And on slide eight, we've also supplemented it with fireside chats. So we have our field notes, but we also host live calls that will allow folks uh, who subscribe to ask questions. And again, uh, the whole point here is to really give an operator's perspective and provide a depth and level of context to fundamental trends that as, uh, as a standalone analyst may not have that type of perspective to offer. And our, we've, we've had a pretty busy schedule so far, but upcoming in November, actually on Friday, uh, I'm excited that we're going to be um, speaking with the former EVP of BBC Digital Studios, who is actually the co-founder of BritBox. So the next few slides uh, go into research process. I'm not going to go through that right now because I've done that before, and probably a lot of you on the call have uh, listened to me talk about process. So uh, you can go through those if you want. But let's get right into it. Uh, we're going to start on Roku, uh, which has been a name that we've been positive on uh, for about 15 months now. And it's been a roller coaster ride, but we continue to think it's uh, one of the most attractive plays on the, to play uh, OTT and cord cutting generally. Um, our key thesis points on slide 18, and I just want to say that all these slides uh, are avail will be available to subscribers after uh, the call. Uh, all the process and overview slides will be available to anyone. Um, but as far as these slides go, um, which is about 70 or plus or so of those, uh, we will publish them directly uh, after this call. 
So that being said, the key thesis points, uh, one being there are about 40 million active accounts in the first quarter of 20. We think that's going to be 135 million by 2025. Uh, it's going to be supported um, by a couple factors, but one being an increased mix to license and the OEM channel and international expansion is going to be key, which we think they're going to be able to ride these license partnerships there. Uh, yes, we are confident that the market is large enough to support multiple players. While there's so much concern over competition, we think that uh, the market worldwide, as far as OTT aggregators, will, um, aggr will consolidate around Roku, Google, Android, and Tizen. And then on the ARPU side, uh, as they grow active accounts, we think that ARPU is going to uh, more than double by 2025. And frankly, we think this could be conservative, just given comps in the space, which we'll go into in a second, um, and video advertising being the largest opportunity. Um, and just keep in mind, Roku is the gatekeeper in many retail relationships, uh, which also gives them leverage um, over the OEM seeking rev share, which is someone it, which is what uh, folks are often concerned about. Uh, point three, this is, these are the thesis points from our August presentation. Um, <clears throat> and then we said HBO and Peacock, HBO Max and Peacock would come around. Uh, we've gotten Peacock, it was a positive catalyst for the stock, so we crossed that out. We still think HBO Max is coming. They just struck a deal with Amazon. The hangup is over distribution of HBO content on the Roku channel, which we can get into at the end of this call if people have questions on that. Um, but the bottom line here is we think as the distributor and as with you know 45, well, with 46 million active accounts as the end of the third quarter and growing rapidly with uh, Roku's leverage <clears throat> over the content companies get stronger by the day, and especially if you're launching an AVOD service, we just don't see how you cannot uh, have distribution with the largest OTT platforms if you're trying to get scale. Um, and then fourth, we don't think Roku needs to land LG or other big OEM partners uh, in order to continue to grow. We think that they can ride the tailwinds of, of their current existing partners like TCL. Um, and then just the other point worth mentioning here, because uh, it all ties into the competition, the cost of developing and supporting a proprietary op operating system is prohibitive. This is like an app store model, right? So if we think about how the smartphone market are, are uh, consolidated around the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, when it, it was also uh, Microsoft, it just doesn't make sense to support a lot of uh, different apps if you're a developer, for example, Netflix or Peacock or HBO Max or any of the litany of or the long tail of streaming providers out there, it is just too expensive to support multiple iterations of an operating system, especially for older TV models. So on the point on um, the account growth, I think it's just you know top down thematically. Uh, this is an oversimplification, but the television distribution model continues to evolve. You have the rise of streaming and the mobile, which has caused a decline in pay TV viewership and ratings. We know that it's continuing to happen. Uh, it's moderated somewhat this year, but it has been uh, a trend that's proved very durable. Uh, traditional media companies have responded by doing a few things, consolidating, especially on the legacy media side, and then launching their own SVOD and AVOD service. And the point here is that they're trying to maintain that uh, c direct relationship with the consumer and transform their business models to subscription-based business models. Disney so far has been the most success uh, at doing so, especially with Disney Plus with 73 uh, or so million subscribers worldwide. Um, but AVOD is also incredibly important because that's a high margin revenue stream to these advertise, uh, to these media companies that they don't want to see go to zero. So they're launching uh, AVOD based um, uh, uh, um, streaming services. Uh, so you have the likes of Peacock. You also have Tubi, um, which was acquired by Fox. Now, the, the main takeaway from this slide here is around how over the top is 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 transforming, right? So the the company that is getting disintermediated are the MVPDs. It's the cable companies. It's Xfinity, right? They are the ones that are getting replaced by Roku. It's not the other way around. So folks thought that Netflix was going to be the preeminent streaming platform, when in reality, it's actually Roku, Amazon, Fire, uh, Amazon with Fire TV, and Google, which are becoming the dominant platforms and turning out to be aggregators. So when we think about the landscape, yes, this is an oversimplification, but I think it's an important point to make because Roku is the one-to-many distributor. There are no geographical restrictions like there are with cable, and so therefore they can scale globally. And to that point on scaling globally, John Malone was interviewed recently, and you guys can check out that link, um, but he said that if the 
on the OTT aggregators. If the platform provider can capture a large enough global scale of consumers who are essentially using it as a bundling service, then they're going to have market power over suppliers. It's just how distribution works. It's how it worked in cable. However, now it's happening in the internet. And as we know, the internet scales globally. On the pay TV subscriber trends, which have in the US, which have been a positive tailwind to Roku, um, there's about 78 million US traditional pay TV subs today. Residential penetration was at 74% since declined to 58% in the third quarter. Uh, we have been losing a million, a million and a half pay TV subscribers a quarter. Um, like I said, this has since moderated a little bit here um, in the last couple quarters, um, but it has been a positive trend that favors Roku. And again, this is as more content shifts over the top, and legacy media companies take a lot of their uh, content that was distributed on pay TV and put it on their own streaming services. And you can see how this is translated to rapid growth, partially um, or partially attributed to the rapid growth in Roku's active accounts. Uh, the key thing here is Roku reached escape velocity, um, and we're deeming escape velocity at 30 million active accounts in the third quarter of 19. And COVID was obviously a bump. We think growth slows likely in 2021. However, as growth slows, we think that platform and monetization uh, and ad revenue specifically reaccelerates, offsetting that. However, it's just amazing to take a step back and think that Roku in the first quarter of 14 only had 4.4 million accounts. And when you think about the pivot that Anthony Wood made to getting Roku installed at, or striking these relationships with the TV manufacturers to just instead of uh, just being a pure stick or a hockey or a puck uh, <laughs> company, which a lot of people still describe them as, I think it's a, it is a phenomenal uh, pivot and one that's going to be looked back on as the equivalent of uh, Reed Hastings making the pivot to streaming uh, back from DVDs. Uh, when we think about the addressable market, we just said that about over 50% of all new accounts are coming directly from these lights, uh, directly being installed with these TVs through these OEM partnerships. When we look at the global smart TV upgrade cycle, it's actually still early on. And I think that's something that people don't necessarily appreciate is that Roku's getting sold in alongside with these TVs. They're in the channel. There's 175 million smart TV shipments worldwide. North America, where Roku has the most share, is 22%. Um, but if we look at where we are in terms of the global adoption, we're only about 30% penetrated. So there is a uh, rising tide situation that's going on behind the scenes when it comes to smart TV adoption. And keep in mind, on this upgrade cycle too, a lot of the TVs that were sold in, call it 2011 to 2014, uh, were first gen type models. They're no longer supported by a lot of the new streaming apps. And so which is forcing people to either go out or upgrade, but it's also supporting the market for devices as well. Uh, because, you know, frankly, a TV purchase is very expensive. And if you, you know, four years ago, you bought a 4K TV and the operating system is no longer supporting a lot of your apps it's just an easier purchase to go out and buy a $25 stick instead of go out and buy you know, a $1,000 TV or $400 TV. When we think about the TAM worldwide, this you know, Roku is the OTT aggregator. So we do think that them, Amazon, Google, it will all consolidate around those three platforms uh, globally. And if our thesis is that every TV in the, is going to need an operating system, then our TAM, if we want to put a, you know, our Blue Sky TAM, is 1.3 billion TV households, excluding China, of which smart TV penetration is 30%. Uh, and we do think that given their uh, expanded relationships with OEMs, as there is an opportunity for Roku to expand outside of North America. Um, <clears throat> even if you exclude China, it's a still a significant opportunity. And when we think about Roku's market share, while everyone's concerned that they're penetrated, um, the reality is that while they have about 26% market share in North America, they're only 5% globally. And they've been competing against the likes of Android, which has dominant share XUS for some time now. And on slide 26, you can see their market share of shipments uh, across North America, um, as well as internationally, uh, growing from about 15% in 2017 with, and expected to grow and, and maintain, or grow to 30% expected to maintain about a third mar of market share. Um, on the international side, we think that Roku can continue to grow, and we're going to show our active account assumptions uh, in the next couple of slides here, without them having to go from 1% market share to 20% of the market internationally, right? 
uh, we think that they can grow and only actually get to 4 or 5% based on the number of just the sheer volume of TVs that are shipped um, in any given year. And on slide 27, um, you could see that Roku's just been a consistent share gainer over time. Um, actually, at the cost of Android, who's actually seen their share, uh, their market share decline. And I think this speaks to Roku A just having a better mousetrap, uh, their ability to get into these lower cost OEMs such as TCL because they have a lower cost build. It is a lower cost, which means it's a lower cost to manufacture, um, as well as their uh, relationship, frankly, with Walmart, uh, which continues to expand. Um, on slide 28, uh, the question we get all the time is, you know, why Roku over Amazon over any of the other platforms? Um, and they do have a higher net promoter score. Um, but to my point earlier, uh, it's actually interesting. So when we do a survey of households, 65% report using a Roku or Amazon Fire uh, device instead of their smart TV. Right. So yes, you get you have this uh, homegrown operating system that's embedded. But the reality is that folks are using a Roku device instead. For example, in my household, we have a Samsung TV, uh, but we use a Roku Ultra device instead. And it's a, it's a fairly large part of the market, which I think alleviates some concerns around cannibalization of player sales, which the street has consistently modeled declining growth. And just last quarter, they grew units 57% and continue to roll out other devices like sound bars, um, which really continue to support growth here. On slide 29, as I mentioned before, most popular streaming device, uh, if this changes, we run these surveys quite frequently, we'll see a dip. That will obviously be a concern, but so far um, Roku is leading, um, at least in the US, uh, relative to the other players. Now price is a huge factor here, okay? Uh, anytime you have a really great value and price, <laughs> and Roku in a lot of cases is free, or the, in the case this morning, they just announced that they're launching, um, they're making available uh, their lower cost uh, player device for only $17. That obviously influences this number, um, but you know, it's, it helps them gain market share. If Apple wanted to get into this market and be a big player, uh, then they shouldn't be selling their device for $150. They should have been in this market selling it and making a land grab uh, for market share uh, much earlier on. On slide 30, I mentioned TCL. This is always something that's, uh, it's their big, it's, it's a very important relation to Roku. Um, and as a platform, the risk is that they get disintermediated. So it's always been a big focus of the bear case. Um, <clears throat> but what we saw, um, despite concerns early, earlier this year that that relationship was either at risk or there was gonna be a revenue share imposed on them. Um, you, they did announce that they expanded their relationship earlier this year, um, both on, um, uh, to more models as well as internationally, which we think is important for the next wave of growth. The Walmart relationship, I think, was complete. People completely missed that earlier this year. I think it's more appreciated now. And the fact that the stock was down four or five percent on news that Comcast was just having initial conversations with Walmart about a few weeks ago speaks to the fact that people are more aware of how important this relationship is. Um, but so far, Roku is um, the provider of the operating system for Walmart's branded uh, electronics. Uh, so sound bars and TVs, uh, and that is, you know, Walmart, uh, everyone knows Walmart. They're, uh, they sell a lot of TVs. So <laughs> having that relationship is really important, and this is a relationship that um, was struck uh, end of last year and continues to do well based on our checks. So at the end of the day, what do we think that they can support growth on the active accounts on slide 32? Um, about 56% uh, of, of new accounts uh, came from the OEM channel in 2019. Uh, we think that uh, domestic growth is inevitably going to slow. Look, they're at 46 million active accounts. We think that they can probably get to 60, 65 across North America. There's about 100 and call it 510 million uh, broadband households in the U.S. Um, tack on another 15 or so, uh, including Canada. So, you know, 50, 60 million accounts uh, is, is definitely going to be reasonable. So we're going to need international growth here to pick up. But fortunately, they're launching devices in Brazil. Uh, they're making, uh, they just made their player device uh, available for the first time in Brazil uh, this year. And we're starting to see in the data that we're tracking for app downloads uh, that continue to grow nicely. Um, but 
you know, as far as monetization goes, it's still a little uh, ways away um, to really start to gain traction. And on the app download side, you can see the data that we've been tracking with the COVID spike. Um, but this is important for us because this is how we're going to test our thesis. If there's concerns over slowing growth on units or competition, we would think that um, app downloads uh, would slow meaningfully, especially since Roku is uh, very well known for having a very nifty app. Um, and mind you, this doesn't include, um, oh, sorry, this, this doesn't reflect the Roku channel now being made separately uh, as a separate app. Um, that's still very early on. Um, so account growth is great, but if you can't monetize, then it doesn't really matter. Um, and that's been transparency around platform revenue and, and how they can grow their platform revenue has also been a key part of the debate here. Uh, they have a, they've done, uh, in the last trailing 12 months, about $27 in ARPU. And that and we'll go into the components here in a second. Um, but just for comparison here, um, uh, U.S. cable companies that have a very similar model to Roku, right? So as I said earlier, Roku is a one-to-many distributor of video content that's disrupting the cable companies. They're disrupting Comcast, which is why Comcast wants to get into this business, because they see them, they made a big investment in X1, their video platform, and they see themselves getting disintermediated. I think it's too little too late. Um, but the point here is that cable companies are mature. They get a share of inventory from the broadcasters on a national basis to sell locally and they're doing $60 to $120 in video ARPU. So we just think that speaks, uh, and this is on a linear basis, right? So we just think that speaks to the opportunity in front of Roku um, with OTT generally being targeted and having even higher CPMs and cable. Um, $27 is really uh, nothing compared to $60 to $120. So, and that doesn't even include um, things like distribution and SVOD rev share. Um, on the over-the-top landscape, this is just um, an, uh, a sample of services, right? I'm not going to go through each one. Um, but it is, we, we, there, there are more services launching. It's not just Netflix. I know people like to think it is, but it's not. On the margin, things are shifting. People are subscribing to more services. Media companies are launching more services. Um, AVOD, I think, is going to be a real opportunity here. It's going to be a real market um, the alternative is that Comcast, Disney, all these companies see all their uh, users or all their subscribers go over the top and all their advertising go to zero. And I just don't think that's a reality. I think that uh, viewership follows content and as content fragments, which we've seen with a lot of these uh, media companies taking back their rights away from the likes of Netflix to support their own streaming services, that ad dollars are going to follow. And we're already seeing that shift accelerate post-COVID. Um, and supported by a lot of the agency, agency checks that we've done, um, which we included at the beginning of this presentation. So as I mentioned, uh, the number of streaming services per household we think is going to set to double on slide 36. We, do, we run surveys like everybody else, um, but we've been running this for over a year, and you can see just how the landscape has already fragmented significantly in terms of OTT adoption in the U.S. with new, new and emerging services gaining ground. Um, Hulu with advertising. Peacock, uh, their free service doing well. I, you know, again, the pushback I get is nobody wants advertising. There's no place for ads and premium TV. There are, um, and we don't have a slide in this deck but we've done uh, demographic work that actually shows adoption. And there is a segment of the, there's a large segment of the population that will deal with watching ads in exchange for a lower price point. There is a market for it. And which is, uh, if there wasn't, we wouldn't see these services growing. And obviously Disney being the biggest success on that new SVOD launch uh, front. So what does this mean? We've talked about this a lot. If you follow us on Twitter, you've been reading our work. The, audio, the landscape is fragmenting. So you know, back in 2017, it was all Netflix. It was, Netflix had dominant share. Fast forward to July of 2020, Netflix share of streaming hours has declined. Amazon has grown. Now this number does include um, not just Amazon Prime original content. It does include 
um, their channels offering as well, so keep that in mind. Um, but you could also see Disney Plus uh, taking their share here. Now, the entire market is growing. So on slide 39, we are seeing, as the collapse of pay TV happens, growth in streaming hours, um, and it's been growing 50% worldwide so far this year. We did have that bump uh, due to COVID. Um, but in terms of where the growth is accruing, it is accruing to AVOD. Um, and on slide 40, and some of these slides, yeah, on slide 40 here, um, streaming time spent by major service and platform. I think this is also a really important point uh, and speaks to the value of Roku as an independent platform in that uh, when we run a survey that Roku users actually spend less time watching Netflix than um, users that are just watching um, Via, that don't have Roku and they just have a smart TV, right? So this idea that Roku provides an independent platform, a platform for discovery, curation, as well as allows media companies to advertise and support their own content offerings um, means that you do have a more fragmented viewing experience and <clears throat> a smaller percentage of Roku households also um, say that they subscribe to pay TV. So it is a superior cord cutting option um, which is why, um, and, and that's not, you know, that's why they're growing so well. And, and you've also seen very positive reviews from the uh, likes of CNET. Um, on the advertising front, uh, this chart's a little bit dated, but, you know, we've probably heard this a lot from Magna Global. 33% of time spent OTT, but only 3% of ad dollars. The reason why this has been the case is up until several years ago, you know, there were no platforms at scale. They weren't gaining any traction with the agencies. So what we saw was CPMs and the price of advertising and linear go up despite the decline in ratings. And it wasn't until Hulu had 30 million accounts. Roku has 30, you know, now 46, but it had 30 million accounts. And they hit that escape velocity where they actually become a viable alternative where agencies can place money. And we've seen uh, in, in terms of taking share, at least in the third quarter, uh, that tick up. In terms of the components of platform revenue, um, I'm not going to go into all the details here, um, but actually I'll just focus on advertising, which is on slide 44, because uh, that's the biggest opportunity. It's video ads, brand sponsorships, and the audience marketplace. Um, the brand sponsorships being something like Geico supporting a content channel on the Roku channel. Um, video ads um, being, well, 15 to 30 second spots, which they continue to roll out new formats. Uh, but you know that's been a, a, a significant opportunity uh, with montageable impressions growing uh, back to 90 percent. Uh, the inventory split's important to understand, so we put this in here. You can take a look at it on slide 45. Um, but Roku gets a share of inventory from their partners. Um, they also have uh, they can also take control over the inventory outright and sell 100 percent of that on a gross basis, which is much higher revenue but a smaller gross margin. So that mix shift is an important dynamic to consider when you're thinking about what the ultimate profitability of this company is. Um, but it also is important, uh, that is directly tied to the Roku channel um, and, the, and the home screen, right? So the Roku channel is largely content, live, uh, licensed content, live linear content from Lexa Pluto, as well as um, a library of content that Roku owns uh, and controls and monetizes on a gross basis. Right. When you see um, apps such as on slide on the home screen, such on slide 47, they get a share of inventory from these other partners directly through the app that's recognized on a net basis. So they're monetizing across the board. The Roku channel is an important source of revenue and future growth, uh, but it's still a very small percentage of total streaming hours today. So as long as things continue to shift in that direction, I think that it's going to be uh, very meaningful to revenue. And that's another thing I think folks don't understand is that the Roku channel is an important driver of future growth, but it's not like it's 30, 40, 50% of total time spent on the platform. It's a very small percentage and it's growing rapidly. And on just the leverage here, keep in mind Roku controls, at least on the device side, um, <clears throat> uh, approximately 45% of total CTV viewing time, which is a lot. Um, when I mentioned before, and this is our proprietary tracker, this is how we get comfort in knowing that uh, our thesis is playing out. So we're tracking the growth rate and channel reviews uh, for Roku. This is through August. We have updated numbers, but we're just showing August for here. And you can see that the fastest growth has really been in AVOD and these uh, virtual multi-video uh, distribution platforms. 
The OneView ad platform, uh, they bought a DSP with DataZoo. I think it was an incredibly smart move. Gives them omni-channel capabilities. Most importantly, uh, it helps them leverage their first-party data, which I think is an, another advantage that Roku has. It helps them monetize directly and consistently hurt, uh, get our checks come back very positive from agencies. And we actually heard that from management, too, in the prepared remarks, saying that they struck, I think, uh, agency deals with the six top holding companies, where Roku is actually being integrated in their internal systems uh, to help uh, target users better, um, <clears throat> forecast better, uh, just better attribution, um, but it also limits frequency uh, frequency capping as well, so you're not just sitting there as a user and getting the same ad fed to you over and over again. Um, we know, I'm going to skip through slides 51 and 52. Uh, this is just the activation process and the fact that they can manage the billing, so again, they're a content distribu uh, distribution company. Um, on slide 53, though, this is what's really important, uh, and they disclosed this in the queue. This is how you, know, you can track the health of the platform. You can see the growth in payouts to content publishers up 82% year over year, paying out $100 million. Um, so this is you know, what they're paying back um, to the likes of Stars or AT&T or you know, Disney Plus for their share of revenue. Um, as well as advertising. And then on these 606 accounting deals, which I know freak people out on slide 54, but they disclose their contract backlog, right? So these are the, the combined value of these 606 contracts, which are basically like software contracts for these multi-element distribution deals, which has in the third quarter is about $300 million and growing over 100% a year. So that's rapid growth, I think it speaks uh, it's just further evidence that their strategy is working. And when we think about what the stock could be possibly worth, look, we get it. This is not a stock that's going to get a, or it hasn't historically gotten like a 30 times type software multiple or like a trade desk type multiple. Maybe we get there. Uh, I don't think, I'm not banking on it, but we do think that as we roll the calendar forward here, 10 to 10, 12 times sales, which is the high end of their multiple range, seems reasonable at between you know, about a 35 to 40% growth rate seems sustainable. And in that rate, we get a, two, a $300 stock off 2022 numbers and then a potentially $400 stock off of 2023. So we think that this is a name that we're going to be writing for a really long time, assuming management continues to execute, which they've done very well. And on slide 56, uh, here are the risks, which we kind of talked about as we go through. Okay. So, spent a lot of time on Roku. Hopefully, that was helpful. Um, we can answer any questions. I'm going to spend about 15 minutes on Match, um, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, and maybe I won't even hit 15 minutes. Um, hopefully, I didn't bore you on Roku. On slide 58, on um, the key thesis points and assumptions here, uh, the, whole, the, whole, our, our, the main thesis here is that Tinder is not necessarily hitting maturity, but their growth is slowing, and that we think that non-Tinder growth is really going to break out um, especially with Hinge, which they acquired, um, I believe, uh, last year, our majority share, which continues to grow very rapidly. So we think Tinder uh, can grow from 6 million subs to 10 million subs, um, that the platinum rollout and premium features are going to help ARPU on, on point number two. Uh, we do think Hinge can grow to about 3 million subs by 2026 um, and hit a revenue run rate of a billion dollars. Um, it's just a high, more affluent millennial target. Daryl, I don't know. Have you used Hinge before? Uh, I don't really prefer, like Hinge. Yeah. <coughs> okay. so, so I use the league, and I'm not yeah. sure who owns it, but I think it's private. For for you know, you get a lot of. Uh, it's kind of like investing. There's a lot of noise on a lot of these apps. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure people consider me noise as well. But I think <laughs> <laughs> what the league does is it. You know, it's it's like if you're a value investor, it gives you, you know, value yeah. stocks or moment. You know, it's, it's it really narrows things in because it pulls off of LinkedIn. Yeah, so you really get people's educational background, a lot of information. So about it's a, them. yeah, you need, and like, you have to apply to get in. So there's you know, quote unquote exclusive. So it's like more vetted. Yeah, I mean, whereas you know, a lot of these apps to me are very similar. Not that not that they're not useful to people because I know they're, they're, they're yeah, but they're skill, but <laughs> you know, you're sort of a little sketchy. You know, yeah, it's, it's a not, bit. not even the sketchy components. It's like you have to swipe. Yeah, fifty times to find somebody that you might be interested in. Whereas yeah. the narrow ones, for me anyway. Yeah, are, are higher hit rate. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, so, uh, so, so, despite Daryl not being a huge fan of Hinge, <laughs> we 
We do think it's going to um, be successful. Well, don't worry. I'm off in a contrarian indicator. So. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and we think product development on point three drives ARPU higher. We'll go into that. And then just these niche apps really starting to get traction. Um, on slide 59, um, I don't think, I, I think at this point, um, online dating is ubiquitous. It's gained a pretty high adoption. You can see this latest survey from Pew Research. Um, they paid adoption is about 18 to 20%. But when we look at the market and segment out, not just in terms of the U.S. adult population, but also like intent, single, and looking, because not everyone that's single is also looking, um, we actually see that uh, adoption is actually much higher, which is fine because of that we think that helps on the monetization front. And again, uh, we're not looking for a breakout of Tinder growth, which is the dominant platform. We're looking for non-Tinder growth. Um, and it's been gaining worldwide acceptance on slide 60. Um, and we've also seen an increase in the number of dating apps, right? So uh, to Daryl's point, uh, you just don't use one dating app. You use, often use multiple dating apps. And on slide 61 in the data, we can see that overlap, right? So here's the increased chance of use. Um, amongst iOS users um, <clears throat> based on the different apps. So for example, I think what's interesting is that if you are a Bumble user, you have a 42% increased chance of also being a Hinge user, while on a uh, Tinder account, um, you're more likely to use uh, Medic or Happen or some of these other more anonymous uh, chat-based. Um, but if we look at the, histori the history of, of, of Match, it's been a roll-up, right? And they've successfully done this. They have a significant market share, 10 million paid subs. And it's been growing at a kegger of 20%. You can see their various uh, portfolio of apps, their flagship apps on slide 63, as well. Can I see that slide? Yeah, go for it. Thanks for using all of these. Here, here's the, uh, the, we also have the match emerging niche properties on slide 64. <laughs> you can have that too. Middle-aged old guys, is there one for that? <laughs> <laughs> There's an app for everything. Yeah. Um, on 65 though, um, it's a, this is the market share, right? So when we look at all the app data in North America and internationally, um, the top 75 dating apps, which represent the majority, uh, Match Group represents 50% of North American users, 40% of international. When we look at, on slide 66, monetization as well as Match's share of that, they are doing the best at monetizing. They've also managed to maintain their share of revenue amongst the top 100 dating apps uh, amongst with market growth, but also from increasing competition, which I think speaks both to uh, the strength of their brands as well as, and Daryl's sitting here, I think he's taking a photo <laughs> of the app, um, but the, it just speaks to their, the, the dominance of Match, right? Um, 300 million global ex-China users growing 15%. And when we did this presentation back in September, what we saw clearly in the data is that mobile revenue was breaking out, it was growing very rapidly, it just hadn't showed up yet through the fundamentals. So pairs, plenty of fish, hinge, all growing. And the question really, uh, and you can see the growth in hinge on 68, um, but the question really- so I, yeah. Actually, I'm gonna interrupt you for yeah, a second. Please do. Because <clears throat> um, I have a theory on this, but. I I, I should have been following this closer, but how is uh, how have the dating apps done during COVID? So you know, like uh, versus I guess versus what maybe it was expected coming into the year. Yeah, I'm sure they probably reset guidance a little. Yeah, it's actually it's a it's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> so Tinder specifically actually had a hiccup. Yeah, um, and a lot of that was just due to just pure disruption and the uh, match cutback and things like swipe night. Yep. Um, bars started closing down, so there was it did result in a little bit of a slowdown. Um, but then we saw user growth accelerate on the back end. Yep. Also, so much of these dating apps are driven by marketing spend, and Match pulled back on marketing, um, along with a lot of other companies. And then because advertising got cheap, they started investing more aggressively. Yep. Um, but I do think that you know, in the world of social distancing, these apps become incredibly more, you know, more more important. Yeah, and well, also so like interactive I, media. I was going to say that I, I I definitely see and hear that anecdotally because it's harder to have the spontaneous meeting of somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And most people, you know, still are very focused on finding a partner, getting married, and all that. So yeah, that spontaneity is gone. So you end up spending more time online, as we know from. A lot of your other companies, so yeah, you know the idea that you invest more, or take more time to date online. I think it's very, very yeah. real and probably sustainable 
Oh, I think with, it's with, a, with I think the, it's in, yeah, it's, I mean it's definitely a durable audience. trend. Um, you know, post COVID, I, I agree with that. Um, we've seen it in the download data start to reaccelerate. Um, on slide um, sixty nine, to that point, actually, if we look at uh, the, they've been launching live streaming. So a lot of the apps have been launching yep. uh, the ability to like do one to many live streaming um, and also do video chats, which for dating apps you can imagine can things can get a little squirrely, but they've done a good job of trying to moderate that. Um, but when you launch um, live stream, like we saw with Plenty of Fish, you saw a big spike in monetization, right? So I think that, I mean, that is something that we saw clearly in the data. We didn't think it was flowing through estimates. So the question then becomes, well, if like, and this is what we were trying to wrestle with, right? So you have non-Tinder growth anemic, um, but all the app data looks like it's really positive on slide 70. And so when we went back and we looked at what they've spoken about and disclosed around their other apps, it's really been this decline in web-based brands and their revenue as they make the shift to mobile that has been a, a really a significant headwind, especially with Match.com. Um, and then, but now we're, we're comping out of that, right? So now that these other apps, we're finally reaching the, the breakout point, which we can see in non-Tinder growth on slide 71. Uh, really breaking out in the second quarter was like the first time that we saw a, a glimmer of hope. Um, and then this last quarter was a thesis validator, but I also think it just helps support our longer term tail call here of a $200 plus stock. If this Tinder growth, which we saw in Q3, and they talked a lot about it on the call, proves durable with 23% um, year over year growth after years of decline. Um, and you can see the different components in the portfolio here. But this is, this is a game changer as far as I'm concerned for the match thesis, which has largely been a Tinder story. And a lot of people have been selling the stock um, because they think Tinder growth is coming to an end. Yep. But if you all of a sudden have confidence in that portfolio play, you can see on slide 73 what our valuation framework is uh, with the base case of 200. It's a higher RSC business. Um, on slide 75, you can look at the risks briefly. Um, and that's it. 40 okay. minutes, hopefully. <laughs> Great. That was valuable. We can go into questions. So we'll go into questions. First question is about Twitter, actually. Uh, do, you, do you like Twitter here? What do you view as the catalyst? Yeah, still, I like Twitter. Uh, I like it more now at 40 than I did at 52, obviously. Um, look, the uh, and, and Jack's speaking today, and I haven't been able to hear that. I think the investor day is going to be a positive catalyst. Um, I think that the, the risk rewards asymmetric to the upside at this valuation, especially with the activist involvement. Uh, we've already started to see them uh, iterate faster in terms of launching new ad formats and user functionality. Um, that all, if executed well, keyword execute, uh, should result in um, faster revenue growth. Uh, I think that they didn't get enough credit off this last quarter for the growth that they did put up. Granted, user growth was a little bit weak, um, but I get it. People are have you know post traumatic stress disorder with this stock after uh, just getting whipsawed over the years. But we do think that we're nearing the corner, and that next year is going to be much positive, uh, much uh, you know, stronger year for them overall. Yep. Okay. Uh, number two. What are your thoughts on Roku's excuse me Q4 guidance? Yeah, so Roku's guidance is always the issue. So they have put up a strong quarter and they issue uh, weaker guidance. We were able to follow up with the company and get some details directly. Uh, look, they had a positive benefit in Q3 from the 606 step up in that revenue contract from a distribution deal. Um, that definitely boosted things. Um, revenue growth, uh, we know that monetizable ad impressions are up 90%, still not growing at the, the triple digit rate that they're growing pre COVID, but getting there. I think that. Guidance is conservative. They're gonna, I'm pretty confident they're going to beat. Their implied guidance for platform revenue growth is about 52%, 52, 52%, which is still above where the street was. And I think that number is probably closer to 60, 62. Okay. Uh, any update on TTD in your short bias? I know it's a favorite of the Motley Fool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that one's we, that bias has just been wrong. Um, and frankly, we put it there as more of a kind of thinking of it as like a pair trade hedge it, for those looking for uh, kind of a um, offset to the, the Roku exposure. Um, and the, the thinking there is that, um, you know, in the walled gardens and those who have first party data are going to do the best. Uh, Trade Desk as a, um, you know, independent DSP obviously doesn't have all that first party data, but they've been doing a really good job of uh, creating an index of users in order to target. 
Um, so I think um, you know we'll have more to say on that name uh, going forward. Um, but you know the valuation's a little absurd. Uh, but you know if revenue growth and it's a high quality company, um, you know things can continue to go on for a long time. Um, but as far as the trade desk goes, um, you know I think they've done a good job executing. The other risk too was IDFA and just removal of cookies that got delayed too. So. That's another reason why the stock's done well. Okay. What what gives you confidence in Roku's TAM, given that Netflix and YouTube make up majority of streaming hours? Yeah, um, I get this a lot. So about so it comes down to that audience fragmentation piece that I mentioned before. So if we think about um, where AVOD is in terms of total streaming hours, it's a small, you know, single percentage and it's growing rapidly. For the Roku channel specifically. It's less than one. It's like one percent of streaming hours. It's very, very small. So as long as the shift of streaming hours is going towards AVOD and not going towards, you know, YouTube and Netflix, and it's going towards the Roku channel, Peacock, and these newer services, <clears throat> that is a rising tide. That is a strong trend. That's positive for Roku. Um, so it's not like I'm sitting here and AVOD's eighty percent of the business, and I'm worried about Netflix taking share. It's actually the exact opposite. Okay. Um, how much leverage do the media companies have over Roku? Um, so they have less leverage today than they did a few years ago uh, when they had less accounts. Um, you know, we've seen spats, uh, negotiations going on, you know, back in June when they didn't launch, when HBO Max and Peacock wasn't on Roku. Um, everyone thought that the long thesis was dead. The stock was at a, you know, uh, looking like it wanted to break 100. Um, then we got the deal with Peacock on the advertising side. I think their leverage on with AVOD services is greater than with SVOD simply because um, if you're Comcast or Peacock, like I mentioned earlier, I don't know how you can launch an advertising-based video service without you know f- access to 46 million active accounts. Same thing with Amazon. Um, the issue with HBO Max is a little bit more nuanced because um, with HBO, they also have distribution of content over the Roku channel. Um, and obviously, HBO wants to have all their content uh, directly native through their app. So that's also a hang up as well. But we think that that's going to uh, you know, resolve itself over time. Okay. Thoughts on Disney here? ARPU growing? Question mark. Parks becoming a sideshow? Question mark. Long term buy, sell, or hold? <laughs> Uh, Disney, Disney, and all these out-of-home stocks are really, you know, a, a, a tough one for my process, just because I try to think about where estimates are and what's baked into the stock over a six to nine-month duration. Um, you know, we've seen the multiple for Disney expand just because the rest of the business has done very poorly. Um, their streaming ambitions have been, you know, they've been very successful in streaming. We we're positive on that. I can't get there. I just I, I can't get comfortable with the Disney long. We'll see what they say at their uh, investor day. Um, but as far as the model goes, the lack of visibility to build conviction here at like 144, um, I just I can't do it. I just don't. It's just okay. Don't have it. Last question: Is there a Chinese Roku stock out there somewhere? If so, have you and Felix covered it? I have to talk to Felix and get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks for all the great information, Andrew. Uh, we really appreciate you guys watching this today and going into a couple deep dive ideas with us, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks.